Hey guys, it's Elucid. Uh, we are going to be talking now about the early game. Uh, this is the next part in the guide series. Uh, for those of you who kind of watched earlier, it's been a bit of a delay to this one. And I kind of wanted to do something with higher production values, but then I realized I wasn't doing it. So anyway, here we are. We're going to be talking about the early game. The early game is a really interesting part of Dominions. On one hand, it wouldn't seem that interesting because you're only fighting against kind of computer controlled independence. You're not fighting against the much more cunning and creative uh, entity known as other players. And so you wouldn't think it would be that much fun. But it's really fun. And part of it is because uh, a lot of the game, once you're getting into the mid and late game fighting players, you are not in control. Like, you're reacting. You're always reacting. A good player reacts. I mean, you're going to have some things you're doing where you're causing them to react. But it's not something where you know what's going to happen whenever you do anything. So, uh, the early game is actually this period of the game at the beginning that you can control. There's very little that is left to chance. I mean, you know, expansion parties can kind of go one way or another based on a roll of the dice. So there's definitely some chance. But the amount of chance compared to later when you're playing against players is orders of magnitude less. So, in essence, this is a part of the game that you can control. And if you do it well, it is going to set you up for a very strong mid and late game. That is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the early game. And uh, one of the other things I want to say before we really start is before I play any new nation, I'm going to take that nation and I'm going to dry test the first 12 turns, usually a minimum of like four times. Four times would be the absolute minimum. And because until you've really tested that nation out like four times, or more. I mean, sometimes it can be significantly more in single player. And you can do it real quick because we're going to do it here in this episode. And I'm not going to like tinker with the clip. You're going to see how long it actually takes. You know, it's going to be longer because I'm talking to it. But when you play that first year out, you are going to get a great sense for how your troops do, how they do against certain types of indies, how they do against other types of indies. And based on that, and after doing it a few times, you'll be able to expand much more efficiently with your troops. Because, you know, the game that you're really playing when you're playing in the early part of the game is knowing how your troops are going to do against different types of indies and based on the, the type of the indie and the quantity. And so developing that intuition is something you have to do. The other thing you need to, to understand from the, the play testing is how do you balance your scales so that you're getting rid of as many of the, the early game resource constraints as you have. Um, so anyway, without further ado, we're going to hop into uh, an actual kind of test game where I'm gonna just show you some of this. So I'm just gonna pick a random map. The map you pick doesn't really matter. We're gonna make a test game. I'm gonna do this with Middle-Aged Dome, which I'm gonna ha probably have a video of coming out in not too long. I could get stomped in that game. If I get completely stomped before like turn 20, I might not put it up, but I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I'll, I'll put it up anyway. We'll do at least a stomp video if I get stomped. I don't want you guys to think I'm only putting up videos I do well in. Because I think almost all my last games I've been putting up. But uh, anyway, actually, we'll just load a Pretender. I was going to show you the one I'm going to build. So this is the Pretender we're going to build, we're going to test with. It is a dormant uh, super combatant build with air and earth. And... Uh, there's a few things we're going to get by this. Um, one thing, this is a pretty solid chassis. She has good uh, attack and defense. She has pretty good hit points. We're not going to do like a full pretender design. You can come up with other stuff, but we're basically full scales. We have production maxed, growth maxed, no temperature. So we're getting really good income. Drain, which you can take as M.A. Ulm and Luck 3. Uh, we have very low dominion, but that's going to be okay because our god's going to be coming out in not too long. And we have good Inquisitors who can get out enemy dominion if we need to. So anyway, uh, this is what we're going to be doing. Importantly, this is going to give us uh, the air-earth cross path, which is pretty important. It's going to allow us to forge a staff of elemental mastery. Uh, it's also going to allow this fine lady to cloud trapeze. She'll also be able to cast flying shield and mist form. And mist form on top of protection means she can kill like an unlimited number of... Uh, non-magic weapon troops, which, uh, given that she can cloud trapeze, can be really devastating. 
And uh, one of the things Ulm has is we have lots of cheap items, which we can kit her out with. One of the things we don't have is great super combatant chassis in the early game. This lady will kind of just be a little holdover to just completely screw over anybody that thinks they're going to rush our little human nation. So, whoops, we're going to pick her and then we're going to start. Now, the important thing really for this, because we're only playing the first year and she's not going to come out, she's not going to impact this, but uh, the important thing really for this is just the scales. Now, if you take, let's, we're going to talk about when you would take an awake pretender. I mean, my pretender guide is going to kind of cover the situations where you want to take an awake pretender, but that is not what we took. We took a dormant pretender, which is not going to be good until we can put items on it, and we won't be able to put items on it until year one anyway, so there's not much point to having it spawn before that. But to understand why you would want to take it, you need to understand your early game constraints. So, in general, you have a few things that are going to constrain you in the early game. One can be resources, another can be recruitment points, and another can be gold. So if you have really expensive units, you may not be able to recruit them all because you, even though you have plenty of resources and recruitment points, you don't have enough gold. Or you have really expensive commanders. So understanding what your limits are or what your constraints are in the early game are super important. If you're uh, resource constrained, this can be alleviated by uh, clearing out your cap circle. Because as you clear out your cap circle, your fort is going to pull in resources from neighboring provinces. So once you have your whole cap circle cleared, you can often have double the resources you're going to have uh, at the beginning. The recruitment points are much harder to increase. And if you are recruitment point limited, you've got to be really careful because the only way you can really get that up is by putting it in your pretender design. So a lot of times you want to sack uh, order turmoil because it's kind of the lowest income scale to, uh, to sack. But if you do that to the point where you're not able to recruit units, then you're in trouble. So putting this into practice, you can see if we get these guys, we can only get three before we're out of resources. We have plenty of recruitment points. Now with Ulm, we have the ability to get these guys who are these guys who are going to give us additional resources. So by the time we get to the mid game, we're actually potentially going to be using a lot more of the recruitment points. Uh, but as Ulm, you totally can sack. Uh, at least one or two of your uh, order scales. That's kind of indicating here that we're resource constrained. So one of the things we can do is we can just get the less resource intensive variety. So you can see this guy, we can get five instead of three. And five of the slightly less resource in intensive units are going to expand much better than three of the really resource expensive ones. So what that means is basically we're going to get the lower resource troops at the beginning and we'll get the higher ones once our constraint is not resources. Because with Ulm, uh, your constraint is almost always going to be resources in the beginning, and then it's going to shift to gold. And once we're gold constrained, once gold is limiting the amount of units we can get, then we'll have plenty of resources. So uh, we'll stop getting these guys and we'll switch to getting these. So anyway, that is kind of understanding the recruitment point gold and resource constraints. So the other thing that uh, is interesting about Ulm is we have a huge roster of units. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there's a big variety. What that really means is there's a ton of different expansion possibilities. Like you have this guy, he's a 17 protection archer uh, with a decent weapon. You could try expanding with them. You do uh, big squads, they shoot at everything that comes to them, and then they smack them in melee. You know, that could work. You could try expanding with each of the different infantry types. You could try expanding with only these war dogs. They're your lowest resource unit. So you can just have hordes of these and try to expand with them. You can try expanding with the knights. You can try with the pikemen. You can try with the uh, the sappers. They're gold expensive, but you're resource constrained early. And they have a crossbow, which fires every two rounds, instead of this arbalist, which fires every three rounds. So you could try that. You could try expanding with these guardians who uh, basically have a big, big weapon, uh, and they cost a little bit more gold, but they have a weapon with a higher attack rating than your other troops. So they're going to, not only is it going to do more damage, but it's going to hit more often. So you could try expansion parties of guardians. All that to say, there's a ton of different ways to test expansion. And one way to do this is to just read through the different stats and the theory craft and say, I think this would be good. I think this would be good. Uh, but ultimately, it has to work in practice, and, and that's what this is going to be. So um, I have already tested a lot of it. 
and I'm going to show you the result of it and how I think you should expand his middle-aged dome. But there's certainly more ways, and you might come up with a better way than I have. In fact, like some of the players that I respect a lot, and I kind of get their advice on different things, one of them was saying, you, you want to expand always with these guys uh, for the early game, and later you can switch to the heavy variety. But I tested it, and I found that wasn't optimal. There's a better way to do it. Uh, but nevertheless, for the first uh, army, we are going to get five additional ones of these. We're going to make this guy a prophet. This guy's going to patrol. We're going to get two of these guys. One of the things is if you have a really nice cap fort like Ulm has, you get to recruit, you get three commander points. So we will put that to effect by recruiting uh, one and a half. And that's basically, I'm not even going to look at marks. We're going to do this really fast. So the name of the game here is Speed. So our next recruitment party is going to be made of Black Knights. These guys are awesome for expansion. So we're now going to put these guys in here. We look around our cap. We have our infantry actually do really bad against Horse Tribe. And this is something I know because I've tested it. It's not something I know from looking at stats. Because you would look at it and you'd say, well, we're mostly immune to arrow fire. But the simple truth is you get peppered with arrows and it ends up hurting. And by the time you get in melee, their lances hit you. It's bad. You don't want to send your melee versus these guys, but we do pretty well against these. So, and we don't do... Barbarians are actually one of the hardest things for M.A. Elm to deal with. You need kind of ranged weapons, and they will smack through your hard armor. So what we're going to do is we're going to put these guys right here, and this is going to be really easy. We'll just do hold an attack, put you behind. We'll give you a hold order like this. And let's do this. Put him back here, and he'll do Sermon of Courage, and then Divine Blessing, and then Heavenly Strike. And just like this, that should be our expansion party. So when you do your first turn, if you've playtested it, it shouldn't take you more than a minute. So like, if this were a multiplayer game, it would literally take me a minute to do it and then send it in. So that's our first turn, and we'll watch the battle. You can see I killed everything with no losses. We'll just watch it. I'll just show you what happened so you can kind of see. Okay, we run in, and then we are just probably going to butcher them. Okay. There they go. Okay, so that is how this is going to work. Now, we want to take this, but it's got cataphracts, so that's actually going to be tricky for us. Um, we probably won't take this super soon, and these are really big provinces. This one we can probably take, and actually our same script will do. Here, we're going to swap this out. We're going to get one of these guys instead. And hopefully that will work. We'll just You need to set your research for it. We'll just do construction for us. I kind of wasted a turn or two, but whatever. And always set your provinces you capture to six. This is my rule. Is six normally. This one is low unrest and not too high population. If it's high population and high unrest, or very high population, I'm going to do 10. Uh, not only to protect it a little bit better, but uh, it will actually reduce some of the unrest, which is going to be quite nice. And that will be that. And, okay, we lose a guy here. Here, we're going to take these guys. We'll put them on Guard Commander. And this is how to do expansion with all of them. And so we'll put these guys back here. You can do this with almost any heavy cav nation. It's not an awesome way to expand, but... Uh, it can be pretty good. Now, the thing we have to do here is we have to get our guys out of range of their mages. That's kind of going to be the trick here. Now, this province is 5,000, 5, so that's not great. I do want to look for where I can put my next fort up. This is something you're always going to look for. Now, there's another thing I want to talk about, too. I went here. Right now, we're resource constrained. One of the things you want to do sometimes when you're resource constrained is you want to clear out your cap circle. But let's talk about the downside of that. These are, these are kind of basic things to think about when you're um, <clears throat> when you're playing multiplayer. Is if if I take my first army and I spiral around my cap, or I spiral for several provinces around my cap, I'm going to help fix my resource constraint much faster. But uh, the issue I'm going to have is that in doing so. I'm going to basically waste the first turn of movement for all of my expansion parties after that. In other words, if I care about party movement point, it's going to be better for each party to kind of wiggle an efficient route out where they don't block off any expansion routes for the following party. So like I could have my first party come here, 
I could have my second party wiggle its way up this way, my third party wiggle its way down this way, my fourth party wiggle its way down this way, and that would be pretty good. Like if you can plan non-overlapping routes for your first four expansion parties, you've done a pretty good job. The problem though is sometimes you really need to fix those early resource constraints. Oh, you know, this is a mountain province and we really need resources. And uh, we actually do really well against horse tribe with these guys. And I say that and these guys are probably gonna run in and die, but traditionally we do well. Um, <clears throat> and we're not going to do hold we're here. We're actually the script for, this is the stuff you have to figure out through testing, but this is the script that works for ho horse tribe is you put them in the corner and you put them on attack closest and they're going to come in and zing one side of the horse tribe while the others shoot at them. It's going to be beautiful. Okay. These guys, we are going to come down here and take that. Oh, hello. This is going to be our first fort right here. So perfect. Uh, and the other thing we're looking for too is to see if there's any heavy cav and I don't see any of that. We're going to switch back to making these guys because we're not going to have enough black knights for our next expansion party and I think that's it for this turn. Okay, successful. Okay, we lost one here and we'll actually watch this battle because this is our first expansion with these black knights. This is unusual. I would expect to not lose any, but horse tribe are actually one of the harder indies to expand into a lot of times. Uh, because they do have a lance and they have arrows. So there's a lot of different types of troops which are going to cause them problems. And they have pretty high defense. Now, ideally, you want to kind of slam into this side. And so I've tried the attack rear script. But if you do that, a lot of times what happens, especially if these guys are bunched out, is you end up having one black knight here, one black knight here, and one black knight here as they're like trying to catch up to the commander and they kind of engage. And that can end in more of them getting isolated. Now, I don't even know what happened, but I'm going to tell you this is the one that's going to die because he's surrounded by all these squares. Okay, maybe not. Maybe it's this one. Okay, this guy ends up getting it. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Yeah, okay. And he shouldn't have died. They should have routed. And they got kind of lucky hitting him. So anyway, that's what happened there. Now, this group, I've tested it, and I know that this is still a solid group. I also know these guys do not like fighting heavy calf. These guys, everybody that we're going to use needs to avoid barbarians, and these guys also need to avoid heavy calf. And these are the things you need to understand when you're testing your nation is like that little rule I've made for myself that these guys are going to avoid heavy cav and they're going to avoid barbarians. This expansion party, the other thing these guys have to be really careful for is tribes because tribes can do tangle vines and that will basically let your small number of knights get murdered. But we can kill tribe, we just have to be really far back in the battlefield. Um, these guys here, we are going to send them south, but we're also going to go ahead and make a commander here. Oh shit, this actually is really bad income. Are you serious? Okay, whatever. We're going to make a commander here, and I guess we'll go ahead and build a fort there. Whatever. We'll put these up to six in both of them. We'll expand here. Okay, now I need, uh, we should be set. I'll have another expansion party next turn. Okay, we lost a couple dudes, but that's fine. We lost one more. So this party's, okay, we got beaten actually. We killed a bunch of them, but if we got both, okay, we have both our dudes. They were healing wounds, that's okay. Uh, we can watch this. Three is a little low, so you can lose. And I think there were more people there than it, there were in the scouting report. So uh, because we soften this up, we're going to come back in and kill it. But otherwise, that group would be out of commission. Here, we're going to take this group. We're going to send them in this way. And we'll do hold, hold, hold. Uh, attack closest. Something like that. Now... We are in an interesting spot where I think we can do one expansion party a turn. 
until we decide to shut down initial expansion. Uh, where should we go from here? Okay, these are basically the same province. I'm going to take this one just to give me a kind of smaller border. Uh, this guy, we're going to go ahead and start our first building. And we'll bump this up to 10 because we're putting Palisades down. We don't want to lose it. And uh, I think that is okay. Anything else we need to be worried about? No, I don't think so. So we'll do this pretty quick. But... Uh, you can see this was successful. We're going to go ahead and expand again. Okay, we know our script for these guys, and it's no holds. It just run in and attack. So hopefully that works. Now, these guys are basically done. So we're going to have them come back, uh, and we're going to make sure we've got six in all our provinces again. We need to be looking for our next fort location, too. One of the things with doing fort locations, and because infrastructure is a really important part of the early game, I'm going to make sure we talk about it, is uh, knowing, knowing whether your nation, if your nation is resource constrained and you need to make troops out of your forts, which often you do, but not always, sometimes you only want forts for mages, then you don't want to cluster forts up too much, like have them adjacent because you'll suck too many resources out of your cap. So a lot of times if you're doing that, you want to put them one away. So like here's a great province for a fort because we're gonna we're not next to our cap. It's got high income, high recruitment points. So anyway, we're gonna put a fort here. So I'm getting a scout to start doing that. Here, this party is still super viable. Uh, I think we need to expand north. So let's go ahead and take these guys. And you can see now where this build is really starting to pick up speed. And we've got a road here, so we can actually move here in one turn. We're going to give these guys the old hold, 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 attack closest. And like that, we are set. Uh, I think we're going to go try to kill these guys, but this is actually a little risky. We might lose this, but the other kind of calculus you have to do in all this is how expensive is it in terms of, like, what is the income I'm going to lose from this province if I have to march this army all the way back? If I'm sure I'm going to lose, then I definitely don't want to do it. But if there's a chance I might win, then often it's better to take a risky final expansion than it is to march back. Like, the farther away from their, you are from your cap, the more likely it is you're going to want to do a suicidal expansion. So anyway, we're gonna, he's going to move there. We're going to move there. Uh, we're going to keep resetting this. And I think that is about it. So I'm going to kind of speed through this real quick. Uh, do we give these the... Okay, these are tribes, so we need to move them to the back. We're going to start building our other fort. Here we are going to... Okay, this party was ex successful too. And... There's elephants. We'll get absolutely squished by elephants. That would be just a complete disaster. Um, okay. So we've got a pretty sizable little force here. Enough to probably finally smash this. Uh, but I kind of actually want to send... Okay, this guy can actually move there. So we're going to put this guy on Guard Commander. And I, I think we're going to split them up. We're going to do like three holds so their infantry runs forward and then we're going to hit them. Uh, this bigger guy, I think actually we're going to do attack closest. Like this. And this guy's going to... Okay. This group may die too. And this may not be something you would want to do. My intuition tells me I probably shouldn't. Actually, we're not going to do that. I know that's not going to work. What could work, though, and this is actually part of what you want to do for barbs, is get a bunch of these guys. And we're actually going to move this guy down here to kill that, and we're going to have this guy just wait. And hold, 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 attack closest. We're going to put these guys on guard commander. Okay, that should work. The other major thing to think about is what are the choke points in the map you want to take control of. 
So, like, this is kind of a choke point, like here, here, here. So having control of this would be really good. This is obvi was obviously super important, so we got that early. A lot of times, by this time, you'll start running into a turn eight, you'll start running into players in a good game. If it's a newer, like a kind of newer player game, then you usually run into players later, because they expand not quite as efficiently. Okay, and then we don't need one of you now, so we'll finish that. Um, the other thing we need to think about is we started making a dude up here, and this is going to be done very, very shortly. So we need to go ahead and move a guy over here to get a lab. He'll be there one turn late. I think we're going to switch to making these guys too. Anyway, I just wasted a recruitment point, but that's fine because this is a test game. Okay, you can see successful again and again and again. And this all comes from the intuition from having tested it a bunch. Okay, and that's correct. Okay, that's going to be fine. We'll position this guy up here. And then we're going to position it this way. Uh, and I still haven't taken this, but now I can. So we're going to put these guys on Guard Commander. We're going to put these guys here. I think we're going to have these on just Attack. And then we're going to put these guys right behind them. And I think, let's check the movement speed, 16, 18. These guys are going to just run in right behind him. And that's how it should be. The problem is these guys are going to get surrounded and die. But now my wolves are going to prevent them from getting surrounded. And hopefully we kill these barbs fast enough. We'll see. This may not work. This is like one of those things where you're always learning, so I don't know if this is going to work or not. It's going to kind of matter how many barbs are there, too. So we'll see. Uh, we're also going to go ahead and kick back another one of these guys. Now, these Black Knights are not as good for player armies, so at some point, usually around towards the end of year one, you're going to switch to what you want to kill player armies. And I think at this point it's going to be these guys. Those are pretty good general purpose. Or sometimes you want to mix up guardians with them. Like Maybe this is what we're going to recruit. And once I get a little less resource constrained, we'll switch over to those guys instead of these. Uh, the other thing I need to do is send a dude down here. Oh shit. Okay, so the barb thing died. There's a reason we were holding off on that. I kind of knew that would happen. Okay, we failed here too. That's unfortunate. Let's try again. We should be able to kill him. We can, let's just watch and see what happened real quick. So... Yeah, we just... It was Tangle Vines that got us. Yeah, the problem is they're not closing in melee. They're all sitting there shooting at us. So maybe we just attack from the back. That may not work, actually. So it may kind of be a problem in our script. Uh, and this didn't work. Got a bunch of dudes everywhere, so we need to go pick them up. I think it's going to be this turn script. And so this wasn't perfect. The, the way I found that's bulletproof... To handle these is you need a big line of your in, your good infantry, like at least 20 units, so it's going to take me several turns. Uh, and then war dogs on the flanks, and they will kill barbs. Uh, or you can get enough archers, but I found that takes too long for expansion purposes. So uh, what is it? I think... Okay, you can see we're at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So we're going to be at at least 23 provinces by the end of year one. So like when early spring starts, probably like 24, which is really high. It wouldn't be that high in a normal game because we'd have players that would block off some of our expansion routes. 
But you can see, anyway, we've kind of solved the expansion puzzle. And I don't want to, since this guide is about early game, I don't want to spend too much uh, time just talking about expansion, because early game is more than that. But this is what you test for. Now, um, the things that, so let's say you do this, and you've got your unit composition figured out, but you can't get more than 10 provinces. Um, if it's because you're resource constrained and it's really hard for you to clear your cap circle, that is a very good argument for taking uh, an awake super combatant, like one of the the tight not the Titan chassis, but the the kind of uh, awake expander chassis. And if you use that person to clear out your cap circle, it's going to accelerate the rest of your whole expansion. So if you try everything else and you can't figure out a way to expand, then you definitely want to consider using. Uh, one of the expander chassis. And some nations basically require that you pick that um, if they have really bad troops, uh, but maybe they have some other redeeming quality that you want to pick them. So uh, that's something to consider. The, the other thing too, and there's a strong case to be made for just picking that chassis anyway, uh, because you'll be a lot bigger because that guy is just gonna be taking one province a turn. So if you think of it, it's like potentially 12 provinces you wouldn't have had. And potentially it can also jumpstart the rest of your expansion because you're getting more resources in your cap. So that even the rest of it could go faster. So, you know, you could easily be like a 30 province nation if you pick an awake expander. The problem with that though, is you tend to get ganged up on more if that's the case. And in the mid and late game, that expander chassis isn't as good often, but not always, because units with weapons that, that can equip more gear, because normally those chassis don't have item slots, they tend to kill them. So that's kind of the trade-off. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, if you can't solve the puzzle uh, through normal expansion, a lot of times you're going to want to get uh, an expander chassis. This will also give you a good intuition for which blesses are going to uh, help you with expansion. Um, a lot of times the blesses which are good against player units that are going to be like potentially more offensive oriented blesses are going to be much weaker in expansion. And the blesses which are really, really good in expansion, like, you know, region and fortitude, they're okay versus players. They're pretty good. But versus really good players, they're less good. Because a lot of times they'll just, you know, if it's regen, they'll just have really high damage units that will kill you before your regen can actually heal you much. Or if it's, uh, you know, fortitude, maybe they kill you with magic damage instead. So uh, anyway, uh, it's a good way to kind of test and get a feel for what you can get away with and what you can't in the early part of the game. The other things uh, that are really important for the early game are locking in your borders. So you need to know where all of the other major players are next to you. And uh, the one of the main functions of early game Diplo is to get protected borders on some of your flanks with enemies that you don't want to fight. Now, uh, if it's an obvious good matchup, like everybody knows let's say you're playing Lemuria and there's Kalem fighting you and everybody kind of knows Kalem's good versus Lemuria or any other nation that has magic weapons is good versus Lemuria, depending on the Lemurian bless. Um, it may be kind of hard to Diplo that, but uh, that is kind of the goal, is to figure out which nations you're going to be good against. If you just want to turtle, you can pe try to get peace on all your borders. Uh, and sometimes that's not a bad goal, um, but, you know, even if you're going to declare war on somebody, you can kind of make peace with everybody and then take your turn or your time figuring out who your first war target's going to be. So that is an option. Um, <clears throat> but that's kind of the, f the first goal in early game diplomacy is just to get peaceful borders and figure out who you want your early war target to be. Because ideally it's somebody you're going to be good against in the early game, not that they're going to be good against you. Uh, and the other thing is to get a sense for who's the biggest. Because oftentimes uh, the biggest player are the people that are going to get coalitions formed against them. Um, and the new, if you're in a newer player game, what will typically happen too is there won't be as much diplomacy and then the bigger players can just eat whoever's next to them. 
Now, if you're in a, a good game, a lot of times that will happen too, but you have to be much more concerned about uh, the people that are getting eaten reached out and asking for help. But if they're getting rushed by some kind of terrifying bless, sometimes other people don't want to help them because uh, they would like to help, but they don't want their stuff to die. So anyway, um, <clears throat> that is mostly early game Diplo. It's securing borders, figuring out who your first enemies are going to be, and then sizing up who's big and who's small. Um, the other thing I want to talk about now is mages. What do you want to do with your mages? So uh, you can have guys out site searching, or you can have them researching, or you can be doing both of those. Um, the thing that's going to matter is what do you need more in the early game? Do you need more research, or do you need uh, more gems? If you have a lot of things which are going to consume a ton of gems, like let's say you're a super combatant nation, and you have a lot of things you can make even at construction four, which is just going to tap out your gem supply, then yeah, you need to get your, you don't need that much research. You need to get your guys out there, uh, site searching so you can have enough gems to kit, kit all of your numerous super combatants out. So in that case, you would want to go out, right? Or if you have good summons that are very early, you're going to need a lot of gems for, then you can go site search really early. But let's say conversely, you have some spell that, uh, you need to get to really fast, like with Ulm, it might be Legions of Steel, and you know you're probably going to go into an early war, and if you have Legions of Steel one turn sooner, it's going to be better. Uh, in that case, I can, you know, there can be an argument for keeping people at home in the lab researching. So, <clears throat> anyway, that's some of the calculus to do. Uh, some nations, I tend to keep all of my mages at home for a good while and just focus researching really hard till I hit one or two key objectives. And once I have those objectives, then I'll start sending people out site searching. Uh, Ulm is a nation where I want to site search usually kind of early, especially if I get one of the important cross paths like um, Error or Astral, uh, which is a, a random roll on some of these uh, mages. But uh, I think that's covered about it. Actually, you know, I was just looking at my notes. I saw two more things I want to cover. One is on diplomacy. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that you need to know about diplomacy is basically, I think a lot of people put too much trust in diplomacy and they think, okay, uh, this border's safe. I don't need to keep any troops there. And at the end of the day, you're opening yourself up to a lot of risk if you pull your Sorry, that was my dog barking at the mailman. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is uh, you shouldn't put too much trust in it because uh, especially there's, there's – if you are a slow map move nation, and Ulm is one of them, if you're a slow map move nation, you have very low diplomatic flexibility, meaning you have a nap three, somebody breaks it. It may take you more than three turns to even get minimal troops to that border. So – uh, that is something to consider keeping some kind of contingent on all your borders. Um, but the real reason why you make the agreement in the first place is so that you can disproportionately kind of undefend one border and move troops to another so that you're going to win a war over there. Because if you think about it, if this is some of the math of dominions, if I take half of my army up here and I keep half of my army down here to defend this border, and I'm attacking somebody, and they're like, oh, I'm getting attacked, but I'm only being attacked by one person. I need to win this. If they take 90% of their army, and they can reinforce it more because we're closer to their theater of war, um, then 90% of their army may beat 50% of my army, even though my army is a better matchup versus them because they just have the numbers. So the purpose of doing diplomacy on one hand is so that not only so that I don't get double teamed, which would be bad, but it's also so that I can leave, let's say, 30% of my army down here and take 70%. And 70% of my army may be able to beat 90% of his pretty handily. So uh, that is kind of uh, part of it. Uh, but the degree to which you can focus your forces on one side of your empire is going to be dictated heavily by the types of units you have and how fast they can move. 
So that's one of the super valuable things about having fast moving units or having fast moving flyers is that uh, you can be very flexible. You can respond to diplomatic changes very quickly. If you're a slow moving nation like Ulm, a lot of times you can't do that. The other thing, and it goes hand in hand with this, is, and we already talked about it a little bit with, uh, with fort building, but uh, you need to build forts you can control. So this fort actually is not a great fort example. It's okay because it's got a fair amount of income and resources, but it's probably really near somebody's cap. Like if somebody's cap was right here, this would actually be a super risky fort because it's three provinces away from my capital and I'm a slow map move nation. So if it gets attacked, it's a long time before I can respond. Uh, and in addition, it's in a place where another player is probably going to be unhappy with me having it and they may attack it. So this actually is not a great fort location. Probably be better to build here. You need to put forts in places that you can defend, but you have to understand that forts are also going to be something that gives you the ability to defend. So you want to use forts to defend portions of your empire because they are basically logistic centers which are going to give you the ability to, to defend things. But you don't want to put them so far away from other things, from other kind of defense networks, like other forts you have or other troops you have or whatever, that they're very difficult to defend. So it's kind of like you, often a good strategy is putting forts two forts or two provinces away from other forts. That's probably the most universal safe strategy for initial fort building, where you know the ideal fort is two provinces away from any other fort. It's on a uh, plains province like this, and it's surrounded by high resource provinces. You know, it's kind of the ideal fort. There's certainly other considerations for different nations and things like that, but that is the basic thing. Uh, the other thing is your diplomacy should be tied to your forts. You definitely don't want to pick a war while you've got a lot of forts going up that could be raided. Uh, and the final thing is that, because we're talking about diplomacy, some players will attack you on the first turn they see you, just like on-site attack. And depending on their nation, that can actually be a pretty decent strategy. So uh, it's something to be careful for, especially if you're building a fort in that province. If I don't have a nap with somebody and I'm building a fort, uh, occasionally I'll PD dump, which is usually not a great thing to do. But if it's like the first couple turns and they have a big army and I'm worried about them just bum rushing me, and I really want to build a fort in that province, sometimes I'll dump PD in there. But dumping PD is not usually very good. Um, so I think that's it. If, if you take one thing from this whole guide, just play test nations in single player, you can see it took me, it took me 20 minutes because I was talking to you. If I were doing it just me, it would take me 15 minutes to play through the first 12 turns. Uh, it'll take you longer if you're thinking more about it because you're not an autopilot just testing it, you're actually thinking, well, maybe I should try this, maybe I should try this. But, you know, like for me, I tested, I tested an all dogs expansion, I tested all heavy cav expansion, I tested all these heavy expansions, I tested uh, mixing in archers. I haven't tested the all crossbowmen heavy expansion, which would be kind of interesting. I've tested doing the uh, high protection troops um, because maybe they have low enough attrition where it's worth getting them over this early. It's not. It's better to get these guys if you're going to go with an infantry expansion, but it's better to get the Black Knights. Um, so anyway, test a bunch of things. Once you think you know what it is that you want to do, then test that a few more times so that you get... Because there's two purposes, right? One is to know what's a good type of thing to expand with, and the second is once you figure that out, uh, you need to develop your intuition for how it does against different types of indies. So if you take one thing from this whole whole guide, it's single player test nations before you actually try them in a multiplayer game. And uh, yeah, I hope you found it helpful. And I think the next episode is going to be on diplomacy. So see you guys then.